Hello everyone, today we talk about the Northern Seas, mostly actually the North Sea and perhaps the Sea of Ireland, part, minimally also the Baltic, but we will expand on this in another video, specifically in the late um, antiquity and in the early Middle Ages. Actually, we could stick just to the 6th century, as we will eventually take in consideration every other century after that and expressing as a foreword some broader considerations from one side about the importance of this uh, region of Europe, its coastal dimension mostly, uh, but also the type of sources for the time and place and consequently drawing some conclusion uh, regarding the, the approach to this topic and what we can also hope to, to add to it um, in the future, both from the same sources and also from, you know, some kind of mm, interpretation perspective uh, that sometimes is not um, properly uh, um, focused on by, say, the, the current historiographical uh, trend, you know, that there has been a, almost an obsession with late antiquity in the last decades and um, today I think the main problems are others where right? we're not even focusing specifically on anything in a in a broader uh, zeitgeist or uh, geist des Geschichte way but um, uh, still could open to let's say an attention from let's say other perspectives as you know I'm not a particular fan of perspectives per se especially when we try to say what was the perspective of these people at the time the more meaningful something occurs and the least a perspective it becomes for anyone involved all right so that's the degree of objectivity that must forcefully be imposed especially in a didactic context methodologically and dialectically because essentially the fourth estate nowadays is simply derailing on you know it's just a perspective yes okay so go back to the fourth world um, and don't bother us right um, we don't want you here um, radical moral subjectivism is just um, um, an autoimmune mental disease and it must be treated medically it's not a historiographical uh, assessment uh, in, in any case um, when we look of course at today where you know the the channel that the North Sea is one of the most trafficked areas um, in the in the sea world, and uh, the uh, the the Baltic too has imposing travel. And we know how you know relevant uh, its development was for the history uh, of, of of the West. We have, of course, to make a giant leap forward in realizing what this world was. Um, since the times started being documented historically. Of course, we will not go too much far in time as far as especially the um, just archaeology can bring us to. That would be interesting. But um, it's only historically that we actually understand uh, what mostly matters, that is, what was happening politically or socially at the time. So we have to re uh, rely on works like the ones of Pythias, Caesar, Strabo, Pliny, Tacitus, Ptolemy, etc. Mostly these are um, either travel memoirs of some kind or some geographic work, right? Everything was kind of mixed also with history, with general uh, political military accounts and so on. Right, and the obvious picture that we get is that Northern Europe, naturally, as as a whole, was a distant horizon from the Mediterranean civilization, um, and there was something attached to it, also by these authors, as far as properly the the concept of boundary of limit of furthermost um, was was concerned. Right, the Morini, for example, that lived in actually even just a relatively close place like um, today's uh, Pas-de-Calais are referred 
to by uh, Virgil as the extremi hominum. Um, and of course the centrality of the Mediterranean um, cannot be uh, you know taken out of the equation not just historiographically as you um, listed of course the authors that could document these places but that's something we can measure also in the traffics right because the Mediterranean didn't just connect east and west but definitely also um, south and north right and there is much of this geographical mentality in, in, in a, an absolute cardinal sense aside from eventually the the actual latitude and, and longitude um, that um, that was deeply felt in a mythological sense in the history of the peoples that inhabited these lands um, I don't know for example the Romans were proud of having conquered Britain because they said that you know it was such a faraway place in the broader at the limits of the world so highlighting um, the, the universality of the Roman domain that not even the gods in the midst had ever set foot there because objectively mythology at least the, the most um, traditional the most universal doesn't of course mention um, that uh, that plays in order to reason a, a, a broader anthropological reference to it. Um, of course, um, there was probably a communication problem as well. Um, the northern seas were hardly a you know frequent destination of considering the the major traffics of the time. Uh, the Roman conquest of Britain um, is an exception and a pretty meaningful one because eventually was to shape in fact the western world um impactfully um and even in this case of course we must realize what what uh, britain was for the romans because we're mostly looking at a at a military front here not just on land but at sea as we will see now that we generally speaking no so the traffics uh that occurred between the island and the continent were dictated by just you know, important political and strategic concerns. Also the fact of course that the Romans had conquered Britain knowing of its uh, important metal supplies. However uh, the Romanization of Britain and also the infrastructural asset that um, entailed also a particular handling not just of the island but um, also of northern Gaul right and the, the 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 broader scale of traffics and needs um, connected with uh, such uh, domination um, allows us also in the following centuries to follow mostly this northwest right even in areas that were not um, directly occupied by the Romans such as Ibernia slash Ireland that however for example Christianizes even be, say with an important degree at least um, and maintains a connection with Rome um, even in a time where for example Celtic piracy was pretty active um, in, in late antiquity we made videos about Gaelic warfare at that time um, and that affected the same uh, Romano Germanic Britain eventually and that allowed us to say play much more with sources with evidence of different kind than say we can do on the Baltic comparatively right and that's quite um, quite important not just in a um, let's say in a in an objective way because we can assess of course that the, the British Isles had undergone an an important change uh, during the, those centuries, but also teach us methodologically what um, could it be also in areas that are kind of less documented comparatively and that can make us at least understand certain aspects of what I'd say having studied in my past early medieval history how much the lack of evidence doesn't actually uh, 
uh, correspond to the, of course, to the vivacity of those worlds, to the fact that, um, you know, the written culture is, of course, an hallmark of civilization, but it's not the only thing that, that is there. Surely it's the most important thing, and surely cultures that write more advanced, more important, and, and there is, um, you know, hardly any uh, any doubt about this. But it doesn't mean that a scarcity of evidence is just... Um, just means nothing, because that's how some historians also proceed methodologically. There is nothing, we can't talk about that. There is hardly ever nothing. Um, but um, and the most insidious uh, attitude is simply having this disruptive behavior, like saying, you know, just we have just so few. And so we don't know what to do more than, than what we already said. Um, I think it's just not having looked at it enough and or in ways that can um, perspectively um, be um, say re revealing about those, those times and places um, of course uh, this is true also for times in which those places were already documented right even in Roman times we don't know so much for example about the North Sea overall Right, so that naturally reveals also the hierarchy of traffics and, and more. Um, and there is, however, a a realization for the uh, mostly deriving from the history of the following centuries that um, makes us realize that, of course, what we don't see was important enough to start making the northern seas playing uh, an important role in the communication system and in the economy of the West in early medieval times. So I made a video about uh, Henri Pirenne and his thesis regarding, as you know, a bit controversially, this idea that, say, he... F he he found in many ways economic history uh, of for for medieval Europe, right? So of course he was placing great importance, for example, to merchants, to just this kind of um, you know entrepreneurial activity that would have allegedly started from out of almost nothing, right? A broader depression. Uh, also, one of the most controversial aspects that still affects today the way we will look at. Um, Middle Ages is pretending that Islamic invasions actually destroyed or disrupted the Mediterranean trade, communications, or civilization, naval engineering, which is utterly untrue. Um, and even in, for, for that case, if people studied more, um, even just the, the, especially the afterwards in that case, they would understand that uh, just like for the Northern Seas, that things do not happen eventually. Um, just out of nothing, right? In fact, you cannot document much, for example, of, say, the, the central Mediterranean during Saracen times. This doesn't actually mean that there wasn't something there to the scale that eventually would bring, say, the Italian maritime republics to take over um, the Mediterranean during the, the, the 11th to the 12th century. And, and so suddenly, by the way, um, so the same goes for the northern seas that deserve to be recognized, especially in the period that goes from the fall of the Roman Empire to the Viking era. So essentially between two moments of crisis for the same maritime trade, because uh, we often stress that the, you know, the Vikings were great traders, and, and etc. But the, the truth is that you know the, the, the Viking era you know, basically disrupted um, most of what existed before right and it hardly created something that um, you know was essentially standing on its feet afterwards this is especially evident in the Baltic because telling the truth the North Sea was kind of more in fact thanks to also the developments that we will see better at some point in early medieval times more progress more advanced you realize that I don't know Knut the Great's Empire for example was what was an important thing, right? You know, he cooperated with uh, essentially with England as he was he was the same monarch of of the land, 
towards a kind of more orderly direction um, and so on but as far as properly the, 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 the piracy because that's what the Viking era was right? it was essentially slave trade it was the single most important activity that wasn't just uh, uh, let's say you know a sort of side aspect of the thing it, it basically was the entire thing and it was functional to the entire system because you know slaves were used everywhere uh, in the north and they would be right some areas of Finland would use slavery um, until the 17th century while others had already simply gone past beyond so um, the um, the, the broader point here is that we need to recognize this, especially the North Sea, as a probably a region on its own, like including also the British Isles per se, and of course not wanting to dismiss at all the deep connection existing with the Baltic. But again, I, I think, however, it's better to look at uh, on another occasion. Right, and that's the type of perspective that I was mostly discussing here, right? So not a matter of, uh, you know, trying to, uh, like most people think history is functional to today, just to take sides with some imaginary people they don't know anything about, simply because they don't study history by any stretch of the imagination, but getting a perspective in the sense of, you know, surpassing this um, mass um, underschooling um, method of thinking that history is just in fact rooting just for a single place and singing, looking at the whole thing in order to get what kind of um, perspective you really need to, to, to adopt right? because history is a matter, it's primarily a matter of method it is a method per se right? and if you do not frame the thing uh, through a uh, kind of objective, in fact, lens by knowing the wall more or less before you can hardly descend even in the uh, in the smaller aspects, let's say, and pretending to to interpret them uh, correctly. So, uh, as we were saying before, Piran's thesis has uh, naturally sparked a, a dramatic amount of uh, academic um, output right uh, the uh, what, what we see fundamentally um, from a chronological point of view is coherent with it right uh, we realize that especially around the 8th century the North Sea began to um, acquire a pivotal role in European economy still being modest uh, compared to uh, Mediterranean traffic, but still autonomous from it, right? Not independent, um, but still being, of course, the product of, in part, the same, uh, the consolidation of the Carolingian Empire, eventually its disintegration. But as we've seen there, a moment of crisis mostly ensues, and it's not before the 11th century that we can start appreciating, in fact, uh, the Northern Sea is also in terms of a, probably of a, of a comparable scale, right, of uh, not quantity, but still um, something that still really has, a, an, in fact, a, an interconnection with the Mediterranean uh, that takes on properly a, a European dimension. A few weeks ago I made a video about, for example, the uh, German and Italian trade comparison in the second half of the 14th century and we've seen pretty interesting things naturally already still still at that time as we've seen Mediterranean trade was in that case 15 times larger than just the, the Baltic one but the fact that there would be an inter exchange on on a broader scale naturally that was a completely different moment in which mostly also um, ever longer range trade was, was starting to occur, even with the great contraction of the mid 14th century. So, during the migration era, things are really different, as we will see now. Uh, just it's a completely different uh, demographic, economic, infrastructural situation. And naturally, this is valid for, for the Mediterranean uh, as well.
Right, but again, the timeline would be this to, to focus on importantly when looking at this war that can be studied with an important degree of, um, let's say, of, of a relevance, I would say, for, for the function of, of a broader European history is between the end of the major Celtic and Germanic migrations and the beginning of v Viking piracy, in which you can observe already. Uh, an autonomy, as we were saying before, from the Mediterranean, because you realize at that point that even though again connections were there, there was probably an axis, especially as far as the um, Christian Latin Germanic world was entailed from Britain through Gaul through Italy, um, of a already a, um, uh, let's say a probably a Western organization, politically, spiritually, and also economically by a degree. We, we saw it, for example, in the video about medieval Kent uh, and the connection there. That, that's one of the best examples, as, as you understand, we'll see it also now, because that was the most intensively um, uh, mercantile reality in Britain, right? And the one that w received more influences from, from the continent was the, uh, being deeply connected, um, also politically with it. Um, it's not all, not just the richest places manage to structure a greater power, but still realizing that that power uh, was built also uh, with the aim of controlling these traffics. So, looking at late antiquity uh, in this broader space, starting from with the British Isles specifically, and it's contact with, with, with the continent, uh, we can observe, of course, a crisis caused by uh, migrations slash invasions. Uh, they were literally the same thing at the same time and occurring, of course, uh, because things were not going particularly well for the empire um, and that would, in fact, especially be evident on the periphery of the same right uh, this was um, an incredibly solid system um, that however had an internal economic balance and as we've seen well in the uh, video about Gallic warfare of the same age the problem wasn't much um, you know uh, you know actually being threatened territorially by these phenomena but rather showing the subjects that the empire could still essentially protect them. Um, the other alternative was an autonomization, which is eventually what the Romans grant to the Britons that um, uh, fundamentally are left on their own and will be uh, in fact further invaded by other groups that however had already been there since Roman times and that would just exploit the crisis to to take over, right? This this is an important distinction between kind of permanent territorial dominations and of also of the scale, of course, of the, the Roman Empire could be and activities like you know migration, settlement, uh, piracy, uh, and, and invasion led in small groups, right? That the empire had already managed these movements, right? And especially in this case, bailed out of the situation, not much because they, you know, they were investing, particularly for def defense of the places, um, if not already in a, in a local level, sort of encastellation, of course, we'll look at the Lithus Saxonicum and this stuff. But in that sense, just also, in fact, installing those peoples there and deciding that at a point that region was not worth defending anymore considering the huge issues that were going on in, in the continent, right? So um, that's, of course, um, a, a way of seeing it. And, and you realize that there is a continuity with this because if you look, for example, at the Anglo-Saxon settlement in Britain, you realize that those were the new establishment and that, say, that the Celtic fringe did not prevail in spite of the fact that, um, you know, uh, in fact, piracy continued, not even the Vikings that were actually much more uh, 
uh, powerfully compacted kind of militarized population say significantly ahead for example to the guiles in warfare so but wouldn't manage in spite of of course the um, the cultural um, blend and you know further settlement right just as it had happened in fact migration in Europe about the Danelo etc obviously um, but wouldn't unhinge what had become uh, the, the kingdom of England and was consolidating on that very specific political and territorial dimension. Um, this I think to be quite relevant and we don't have any time now to digress on how this also had come about what for example the Romans in many ways had installed themselves on back in the day. This is not the point. The, the point is looking at late antiquity, the migration era, that this maritime migration and concomitant piracy went on for two or three hundred years, right? Um, and most of the movements had been um, undertaken, not just controlled, by the Roman Empire itself. And mostly, and that's why we focus on the maritime side of the story, for the purpose of, in that um, case, the British coastal defense. And these, th this coastal dimension will remain also in the territorial establishment of, of Britain. Um, and we have also movements of people of people from Britain to other places uh, or it could be the same other parts of Britain for example we have um, uh, people from Scotland that moved from say Scotland didn't quite exist as such at the time but you know geographically to southern Britain you have uh, a movement from Ireland to Western Britain famously enough and also from uh, southwestern Britain to Brittany, also famously enough. These movements that had begun again when the Roman Empire was already well established in the region began to slow down only during the second half of the 6th century, right? So well after the uh, Roman imperial presence there and essentially at the end of what fundamentally for Western Europe is the migration era, right? In, in Central and Eastern Europe, the thing went on for a longer time. But essentially, there is a, a final settlement, right? When the political and social balances of the broader, most of Central and Western Europe were re-equilibrated. In a way, there is also a great contraction. So a need also to concentrate a territorial power, even though more fragmented than before. And where the coastal dimension starts, um, you know, activating a very interesting maritime output. Um, we know the Anglo-Saxon migration, we know the so-called Saxons. It's complicated, of course, to, to, to split the ethnicities here, but fundamentally this was a major Saxon uh, core, campaigned or followed by the Utes from northern Denmark, the Angles from essentially the Schleswig, Holstein, the Frisians from the Netherlands, and actually even the Franks from the Rhine and the Mose um, Delta area, which is important considering, as we'll see now, that we do have um, evidence of Saxon settlement also within the boundaries of what had been established at that point as the Merovingian Empire, and therefore, uh, me uh, therefore mentioned connection of Kent uh, and other southeastern uh, British lands to, to 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 the continent in that in that direction is naturally quite ill. Uh, the raid of uh, the so-called Danus Rex Cloci Lycus that may be likely the Hugelac of the Beowulf poem, dating around 525 and directed to the northern shores of Gaul is the last maritime movement of a Germanic people to be explicitly recorded in written sources uh, 
um, during the so-called migration year. Of course, there, there were others, right? They went on f for a while, and as you will see now, again, these movements, you don't have to imagine just necessarily a, a tidal wave of peoples. Actually, these movements lasted for centuries, and they were quite um, sometimes nuclear in nature, right? And um, I think Britain is a good example also for what the initial Anglo-Saxon establishment was about, so several tens of um, of chiefdoms, of, of um, small monarchies that didn't have a, a unitary pattern, in spite of the broader awareness of the collective identity, especially over the peoples that had inhabited the British Isles, right? The, the Properly the Anglo-Saxon crystalline clear uh, imperialistic mentality for which they knew uh, in the moment they set foot there that they were in charge were to command over the others and that that's also uh, an incredibly powerful uh, aspect that I often um, you know stress because uh, at least in this case of course it took a while before the uh, the Anglo-Saxons compacted like other uh, Romano-Germanic kingdoms they were in a sense the exception but as far as, as we were saying before, as their moral and cultural prevalence in Britain, there is no doubt that they achieved something, and it was even at least successful on the longer run to this day. Um, naturally, this was also a, a moment of um, insecurity, right? a moment of crisis, of, of migrations, of wars, and so on. Uh, and as such, the maritime uh, communications, as we were saying before, had been suffering, right? However, they had not been impossible, of course, mostly because, as we've seen, you know, uh, these all these activities took place across the sea, um, in part. We see also just in terms of, as it was habitual, right, yes, wars, but also as the exception in, in the absolute timeline, right, so in, in the meanwhile, also enemies kept trading. Uh, we see some ancient shipping uh, routes remaining busy at this point. So if we look, for example, at between the, fi the, the mid-5th and mid-7th century, we see something that goes far beyond, of course, the North Seas, and uh, that is kind of very interesting because it, it witnesses a an important connection between the, the Levant, so not the central, the western Mediterranean, probably the eastern Mediterranean, far to, and northwestern Europe, right? So this is impactful, because you realize these routes existed specifically with the aim of reaching the British Isles. They passed along essentially the Spanish and Gaulish coasts, probably had something to do with, with North Africa, as well, but we get, for example, from the life of John of uh, the, John the, the Alps giver, that was the patriarch of Alexandria, died in 619. So a time which, from an Alexandrian perspective, um, in Egypt, uh, the, the world was still there, right? It had not crumbled yet, um, and it telling us that um, a merchant ship which sailed from Alexandria to literally the Isles of Britain, so probably in that case what were known uh, in antiquity as the Cassiterides, the Isles of um, Scilly and the um, southwestern British mainland as well, but that's probably what, what, what they meant in this case. In 20 days and nights with a cargo of corn and returning with a cargo of gold Inting. Now, this is impactful, too, because you realize that in the 7th century, it was normal from Alexandria of Egypt, that was formerly within the Roman Empire, in spite of all the, um, you know, religious noisances going on with Constantinople, etc., was basically still relying on golden tin from, from Britain, practically, um, and was exporting, naturally from Egypt, mostly corn, um, and the the source is 
pretty, um, you know, um, pretty certain about, or at least pretty firm in assessing that it just took just 20 days and nights. Naturally, it's it's pretty debatable that in the 7th century you could just take um, such a short time to, to, to get there. Um, and especially after the uh, Mediterranean unity wasn't, let's say, it was still there, telling the truth. That's also what we tend to, to, to not realize. But it wasn't, let's say, uh, of course, reaching, for example, the, the whole Atlantic coast in practice was was out of control of the Romans. But th this is not important. The important here um, is that still that communication continued. Those people that had inhabited the empire uh, still were essentially relying on each other. Uh, independently from the different political assets that um, Western Europe had taken. But as I have explained very often, also for the Romano-Germanic kingdoms, it was kind of obvious to feel themselves that they would actually, especially the elites, that were the ones who were actually managing this long-range trade the most, considering themselves as part of delegated, legitimated, or ruling on behalf, put it in many ways, uh, of Rome, right? There are 10th century Anglo-Saxon rulers that call themselves not Imperatoris but Vasileioi. I, I don't know if you realize what this means practically from a, from a mental point of view, cultural point of view. Um, and we can see archaeologically that uh, a significant quantity of 5th and 6th century jars, bowels, and amphorae, the uh, so-called A and B wares in the uh, in the subject from definitely uh, the entire Mediterranean in several aristocratic and or princely sites in Ireland such as at Garrains and Clogger um, also the British um, could call it for a far west right so uh, Tintagel in Cornwall Dynas Powys in, in Wales, and even in the north, at Dumbarton Rock, for example, proving such long-lasting uh, connections um, even during the so-called Dark Ages. So bear in mind that uh, the especially the this uh, this localities that we mentioned here, as you understand, they belonged to the Celtic fringe, right? So these were not even part of the, you know, some of the most powerful Anglo-Saxon um, um, ch chiefdoms, or you know, something bigger as the, the were coming kingdoms. Effectively, um, they were just kind of random Celtic uh, aristocrats right uh, on the Irish Sea or in or as far as Scotland and they regularly had trade relations with the old Mediterranean naturally this evidence is unequivocal right as rare because um aside from the archaeological finds that are they have a a complexity that goes beyond actually the uh, the the discipline they have to do with how much you pay people to dig and, and actually as you know the British are pretty and rightfully um, you know but very active very interested very uh, investing in their own history right but um, consider that there is much more out there even those same places for sure and so we don't get even remotely the, the fuller picture um, Equally, the written sources are very sketchy, as you know, um, as far as, um, you know, Britain is concerned after the, uh, the, the leave of, of the Romans. Um, we know for a long time a very few, right? And we enter properly in another uh, historiographical register. There are surely lots of later sources that start writing about past, but... but events but it's uh, of those centuries but it's just not much um, in terms of actual certainty right and we can easily see sometimes the, the discrepancies and or the approximations that were of course normal given that 
that situation. Um, and we know, of course, of some contacts existing between, for example, the Celtic fringe, a connection with uh, Atlantic Gaul, uh, in some cases also with other Celts in Brittany, as you know, from the Irish saints' lives. Right, uh, early medieval geography is um, an, an enormous pool of information. It's somehow weird when people tell you, "Oh, those Christians arrived and destroyed all culture exists." But have you ever read early medieval geography? Do you, do you actually know what it contained in them? Um, and um, of course, these connections entailed trade in a way or another. Actually, sources from sixth century tell us nothing about any specifically commercial traffic between the continent and the British Isles. But it's obvious that uh, some facilities, some infrastructure, some, some communities were just, you know, um, continuously involved uh, in trade. Um, even here, the, the, the trace of the Roman past was important because important uh, ports in the region, such as um, Gesoriacum Bononia, that is today's Boulogne, uh, and uh, so in, in Gaul and from uh, the other side of the channel Dubris, so Dover and Rutupia, rich borough, um, are not mentioned by the sources, but of course they maintained, um, evidently from an archaeological point of view as well, a just with the continuity of, of the older settlement, um, a function of that kind. Um, consider that these places were frontier because you know it's much actually easier to move by sea than by land uh, and that's why also in fact the maritime connections are crucial here and that is valid also for warfare right these were military ports that the Romans had already essentially established on the base of previous Celtic settlements that were definitely involved in that kind of, of business. Um, probably one of the single most overlooked topics ever during the Iron Age is, in fact, the, the broader Belgic um, political military activity across the Channel and beyond. Um, and uh, specifically, these the aforementioned centers were also the uh, seat of the classis Britannica, so the British fleet of the Roman Empire, uh, which had served as a powerful deterrent, we've seen this in the video about Gaelic warfare, um, had been chasing the same Celtic piracy at some point. We can think even as far as, uh, you know, Iceland, some say, that's how broad the range really was. And you shouldn't see that as something so so strange after all. Right? The, the important is understanding the effort that lay behind this, right? Um and the the classis Britannica was particularly important as you understand because it also de facto connected Britannia with the continent. Um between the, the fourth the fifth century, right? This um fleet had been consistently um, established um, uh, since the, the first century, right? But in, in the third it had been powered exactly because the northern seas had started becoming more turbulent, not just, you'd say, uh, atmospherically speaking. Um, and another massive military infrastructure was the Litus Saxonicum, as well, which was a broader mm, name for the 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 type. There is historiographical debate, right, about the degree of let's say specifically military function, who essentially was in charge of that. What kind of let's say of a, a space was uh, just given to to the settlement of immigrants from the other areas of the North Sea, etc. But it was evidently established to protect Britain from most of the threat that um, came mostly, of course, from, from the East, but not only. Right, there were other important um, 
coastal centers, of course, such as Rotomagus, that is Rouen, on the sand, you know, has a splendid uh, location. Uh, Namnetas, that is Nantes in Brittany, Londinium, of course, London, and Eboracum, York, um, still appearing in the sources. Meaningfully enough, however, in spite of their obvious um, maritime uh, importance, uh, directly or indirectly, um, they are not longer referred to by these sources as ports per se, right? So, of course, again, crisis, um, political fragmentation, and greater need for actually shorter range um, territorial domain, which n doesn't necessarily mean less, um, for example, shorter range trade, but definitely it was a contraction in that, and so the terrestrial dimension probably prevailed, and probably in the political uh, mechanism of, of course, this um, this tumultuous process, yes, maybe even the, the naval side of the story was even increasing in strategical importance, uh, given that these individuals, f f in relative terms for these individual centers to care, but um, most of the threats would also come from just say straight the, the land also because uh, as these events proved there was really no way to stop uh, naval immigration uh, maritime immigration with the means of the time and of course the ultimate goal of all these peoples was to create uh, uh, a land power right so that's where things would be played anyway uh, there were of course still important connections between the Isles and, and the continent. Um, the, uh, as we've seen, the actually the, the geographical pattern of the various migrations, it's also the connections between the, the groups w was quite uh, stretched, right? Um, it was in, in many ways an autonomous movement, which part of the, the reason also why um, the the Epturkey say was formed is that there wasn't like in continental Europe like one entire people that just had the bit of a trail, but let's say moved all at the time. Like you pick the I don't know, the, the especially the the gods, the long birds. Um, in many ways, w when you look at for example the Franks that we mentioned that are often considered just more like a continental thing, but they had their time. In the 3rd century, Frankish piracy arrived as far as the Black Sea, as the Levant, right? So um, they knew how to move at sea. But um, you understand that also as far as the Alemanni are concerned, that there wasn't really like a mass migration of a people from one place to another, but it was just m more like a gradual permeation, right? The occupation also over time, as it had happened, for example, on the Rhine, um, think about Cologne was assigned to the Franks, etc., to form some sort of buffer states against the other peoples of, of Central Europe and so on. So in many ways, aside from what just stands out as the the, the sea boundary, just geographically, um, it, it's easier to see this actually as, as, as if there, there was a continuous political con um, uh, pressure, right, um, between these groups, and that... Um, in fact, the sea was uh, extremely, an, an extremely uh, effective highway, right, to you know propel those forces. Um, um, so we look at the various peoples that established themselves, for example, from from the same Celtic fringe further into Britain, because even though this was being penetrated by the Anglo-Saxons. Um, lots of interesting things were were occurring within most for for that for for triggering that arrival. So, also from the the Irish side, the Scotti, so from Ibernia, Ireland, um, in um, in Caledonia, so it would be roughly today's Scotland, um, and particularly in the Dal Riada in the southwest of the country, or in Cambria, Wales, uh, as we can see. Uh, in Diefeld, for example, are you know one of, some of the most meaningful examples because at that point you have literally a country that will take the name uh, from the Scotty 
that lived in another country, right? And that managed to essentially Scotticize, in fact, Caledonia picked land um, to make it become Scotland, even just historically. So that's how impactful, again, that uh, movement was. Um, there are debates naturally in regard. I made a video about medieval Scotland explaining also, you know, what was, was their substitution, even if not, right? But the cultural and political influence was so strong in that sense from, from Ireland that the country eventually took the name of Scotland uh, itself. Uh, the same goes for uh, for Brittany, that was known as Armorica. The Britons from Cambria and Dumnonia, the latter essentially being Cornwall, um, and um, and the southwestern peninsula in general, were, were to be found in, in fact, in what was ancient Armorica, so that from that point onwards, uh, Brittany was, uh, came about as a name, Britannia, right? Uh, and that's also powerful, because, yes, that was not a, a particularly populated or Romanized place historically, but it literally takes the names from, from these um, Celtic elements who were apparently fleeing there from the the British um, uh, island, uh, the the uh, from from the Anglo-Saxon uh, onslaught, right? Uh, and Brittany would have its own independence fundamentally until the, the modern age, as the fact of Celtic country. Uh, in fact, I made a video about medieval Brittany. By the way, if you're interested, we'll keep talking about it, as well as all about all these other lands. Um, and um, this Celtic um, movement was particularly important in the second half of the 6th century, which, as we've seen, is also the moment in which, from the other side, the maritime Germans, if we can call them like this, the Nordseegermann, settled for good, fundamentally, in mostly in the east and the south of Britain, as you know, uh, but not just there, right? There, there's been for a long time this this concept that you know the Celtic and the uh, romano bretonic and the Anglo-Saxon land were somehow all you know neatly patterned uh, with some you know important boundary distinction. Of course, there was an important concentration, but the Anglo-Saxon settlement was actually much more extensive as far as probably as the coastal dimension, as you understand, was concerned. Right? It would be also easy to think about it logistically, to arrive in one place, all with the ships and all, and see how many people are here already, and you would find Anglo-Saxons since ever. Right? There were Anglo-Saxons that had I don't know, settled there since the 2nd century AD. They eventually had Romanized. Maybe uh, were part of the people that fled to uh, to uh, Cornwall or Wales and eventually maybe emigrated even in, in Britain, right? And that they thought of them as, as they were, de facto, because, you know, what what's their uh, uh, a national identity? They're as Celts or as God, God knows what, because there was also much greater uh, importance uh, of clanic identity by some degree. Um, and the same is valid for areas like Scotland, for example, that surely was settled by the Anglo-Saxons, that generally speaking would also maintain the upper hand, as you know, right? Even it, it was clear, again, that the Anglo-Saxon influence was just pushing against the Celtic fringe. It was softer than this pretty harsh, um, warlike population. It was much more densely um, uh, you know, uh, aggressive and, and effectively so from, from a military point of view. Um, and you find Anglo-Saxons um, everywhere, right? You know, you can also look at the continent, as we were saying before, that actually were was also the, the, the most appealing area, because always consider here that these peoples were moving also because kind of the North Sea Germans were not as politically and socially compact as, say, other Central Germans as we've seen the Franks, uh, 
uh, the, the Alemanni or the Longbirds, they somehow were more primitive, less socially stratified, consequently also more politically fragmented. And, and some groups settle in places like, for example, uh, the Bessin around uh, Bayeux, the same one of the, the tapestry later on, um, also in the Boulonnais uh, around uh, Boulogne. So you understand, of course, the aforementioned ports being just an important fact point of arrival to for, for in function of further dislocation. But we have, for example, the lower valley of the Loire, witnessing Saxon settlement. And these are basically the same waterways that the Vikings, the Norse, will take kind of later in the following century. So uh, we have, again, conceptualized the Viking year as if, you know, this thing happened is, was just an exception. But if you look at the migration era um, in Northwestern Europe, you, you see pretty much the same patterns, right? Uh, we see, I don't know, in the mm, Ponteux area, uh, in essentially in the coasts of northern Picardy, between the rivers uh, Canche and the Somme, um, the the Caen area, um, a Saxon presence uh, from cemetery excavations. These people could even have settled there as part of other local communities, not necessarily taking their place, but generally speaking, they would try to maintain an autonomy, they would settle in islets that would maintain also some kind of distinct culture for for a while that we have seen this also in, in the Viking era right the Normans that settled in the lower sand um, strictly meant were were more easily francicized areas like the Cotentin maintained just you can see it from the people there genetically that they're more like Norse uh, there is a, a greater trace of it statistically so um, Things can differ, and this again is a po uh, is a moment of great political fragmentation. So such differences are even highlighted and exalted, if you want. Uh, naturally, there are also much bigger kind of regional scale dimensions, such as you know everybody becoming Anglo-Saxon, more or less southeastern England de facto. It's obviously just a political thing, right? Uh, culturally, they eventually became. Germanic, um, but they were, say, the previous, I don't know, part of the descendants of, of the Belgians, of, uh, of uh, pre-existing populations, of, I don't know, Italic settlers, and whoever had come there to Roman times, as we've seen, Anglo-Saxon descents that were, however, by that point, Romano-Britons, and that eventually re-Germanized at that point. So, it's it's pretty interesting to, to look at the pattern so more openly because it tells you as we were saying at the beginning of the video way more things than you're normally made thought of um, so of course the relative cultural linguistical homogeneity it would derive from these various areas like like the Celts in the west and the Germans um, or probably this Nordsee German in, in, in central and eastern parts of the British Isles um, were the, are the main indicators, but in this sense are also the product of uh, coastal settlements and of some cultural influence and all competition that would polarize even these identities in the same Britain as far as the also the modern cultural boundaries are concerned at least you know when when people in, in those places at least spoke uh, still Celtic and not English in any case um, you realize that they were pretty much interconnected they were just close to one another and they were in direct connection with uh, with the rest of Europe by an important degree uh, we find an interesting archaeological distribution of specific uh, um, items such as the D-ware, that is bowels and plates, and E-ware, wheel, throne, uh, pots and jars, 
um, that essentially came from Western Gaul, and we find in in sixth century sites in Ireland, in Scotland, in southwestern Britain, the aforementioned Scilly Isles. Um, the Anglo-Saxons from their site are mostly distinguished by the, the brooches, the, the disc or bottom ones, um, which uh, are not found just in the south of England, mostly in the cemeteries of Kent, Sussex, the Isle of Wight, but also uh, aforementioned cemeteries um, such as the ones of Ponteau and Caen. This is interesting because it it shows evidently the fact that the Anglo-Saxons had grabbed the most advanced and productive areas and so that the Celtic French that was so um, uh, also in Roman times technically because the Romans hadn't occupied Scotland or, or Ireland directly in spite of the context remained aside right so the contact with Gaul were stronger in what had been historically south the southeast of Britain uh, the most populated, the, mo the, the most advanced area. Um, and were the Anglo-Saxons um, and their elites essentially installed in so these brooches are mostly coming from that kind of also social background. And that's why we can't find them in the first place uh, compared to lots of you know other burials that didn't contain them. Uh, so men ships uh, crossed. Um, there were landing places, evidently. Uh, there was surely an infrastructure that uh, either continued from the past and or um, simply was um, even enhanced in part at this time, depending on what was rising as opposed to falling, which also is a thing. Um, however, the archaeological evidence for such maritime um, facilities uh, and even just settlements are is scarce right we have um for example some weighing scales found in both english and continental graves written records do not talk much about these movements but you, you know obviously the word there right um sources however talk about ships because this had been literally the, the means they had used just for the conquest. They had an important uh, meaning in in the culture of those peoples. Think about the Kuraks, right? Uh, in the De Excidio et Conquesto Britannia by Giltas, um, there is the reference to the Celtic Kurache, uh, so literally the famous Kuraks, um, which could vary actually in size. We've also talked about them in. Gallic, uh, in the Gallic Warfare video it contains all of it, these things. They were very simple uh, boats, telling the truth. They they were, however, functional to this kind of fragmented piracy, assaults, raids, um, and they, they were pretty effective because also they could simply scatter, not being chased by, like it was also at the time, major um, Roman ships. That's also one of the reasons why the late Roman fleet had actually been using much smaller um, ships than say, uh, the ones that the Romans used in the Mediterranean in the Hellenistic period, say, uh, the Battle of Actium, or things like these. Uh, a bit just like the Roman uh, land forces, and um, they ha had uh, split to just to cope better with these various scattered raids that counted exactly on that, essentially on an attritional... Um, and it would, the objective was not even to destroy, probably. They, they just wanted to grab... To, to loot, to accumulate surplus, and hopefully settle and rule from there, right? This was the deal. It was not a broader point of destroying Roman civilization, which is, in fact, what didn't really happen. Um, and according to the, the aforementioned um, the Excedia by Gildas, the 6th century Britons, or Romano Britons at that point, knew of two kinds of boats. Um, uh, the Korags or hide boats were already described by Caesar uh, in his time, first century BC, but also they would by Adamnan of Iona in the eighth century, right? And the Korags were propelled uh, by either 
wars and or sales um, at the same time uh, they probably look very similar to what we can uh, observed from the beautiful first century PC gold model found in Breuter um, in the county of Derry in, in Ireland um, or uh, like the ship carved on the Kilner Ru uh, and pillar in the county of Cork in, uh, also in Ireland. The other types were what were called in, in the Latin source the longe naves, so the long ships, uh, which were instead probably planked boats um, propelled by, by sail, um, which may be suggested by uh, the uh, coins issued by Kuno Bevin in the first century AD. Or also by this, uh, the St. Peter wreck um, from the 3rd century in Guernsey. Uh, the Anglo Saxons had um, thus long ships as well, and the etymology is, uh, is, is the same one of keel, right, in, in the modern English, coming from um, seal or keel. Um, in, in Latin render as kill or seal. This word probably is the best to define the famous 4th century uh, Nidham boat found in Schleswig Holstein, so we're looking at essentially the same areas from which the, the Anglo-Saxons had uh, come from. Um, and um, these were long clinker built wooden ships right they um, were mostly used for especially for military purpose and, and during the migration here in general by oars rather than sails and Sidonius Apollinaris in the 5th century uh, Gaul talks about them Procopius too uh, of Caesarean sixth century documents them um, and they were essentially symmetrical in profile they had a relatively flat bottom like in some of the uh, later Viking ships so they could they could be landed pretty much everywhere they could um, sail up a uh, river uh, they could um, be just uh, uh, placed uh, hidden sometimes also during this uh, raids um, and landing places as a consequence were probably many and different right uh, especially if you consider the sandy shores of the southern coasts of, of the of the North uh, Sea um, and in this sense you can think even at, at the Baltic uh, in Poland because Again, we have to see also what was happening on the other side at some point. But these were very somehow easy to use. Think about, I don't know, places like the Netherlands, right? This, th those are ideal places to land, but even the great uh, Gallic rivers are easily navigable. Um, and not just by, by these more kind of raiding suited uh, ships. Um, as a consequence, also trade aside from the military activities must have been pretty um, scattered as far as the trading ports specifically were could could be set up could be located right between the end of the third century and the beginning of the seventh you realize as we've seen that the Roman ports had been declining but other trading ports were created as much as a, um, a revival of port activity resumed as we will see in another video um, so there are centers fundamentally emerge uh, after the more politically fragmented pattern uh, 
Um, but also the older ones remain fundamentally important because they are also well defended. They have stone walls which dated from, from Roman times. They had been partly integrated with other defenses, but they were massive infrastructures which naturally provide with an important degree of um, protection and also where, where the goods could be stored, defended. And uh, this is evident in, even in much more primitive areas like um, picked land, think about all the various um, uh, stone forts that must have required a, an enormous uh, effort and given that there wasn't much of other um, essentially long uh, lasting infrastructures from those times, so th there is naturally a markedly military nature of them but they were evidently designed to um, to store the looted uh, goods, uh, but also to launch raids to loot from them, right? So it was all very symmetrical as far as within the same populations that carried out this raid were, uh, were, were concerned. Um, and uh, we we do have example of Celtic um, raids against, for example, the Roman forts of Anglo-Saxon Britain that ended up ruinously because they were much better defended uh, fortifications uh, so this definitely had a role in the distribution of uh, trade like of wealth in first place and consequently of trade um, between these various centers right however we managed to find also more um, exposed avant posts such as from a maritime perspective beach markets um, other trading ports right on, on the coast uh, and of course cl also close to river mouths uh, as always controlling the uh, the traffic there that were unsurprisingly distributed around actually some of the most powerful at least centers um, locally um, and as these um, powers could essentially to their deterrent capacity prevent some raids in the area and or however in case of attack of course um, stopping to, to trade with the, with the foes and so becoming also a matter of political and economical uh, weight whether to just to, to, to put oneself against such uh, center high status settlements or not right to, for further exchange um, and that thus also could be better control right centers uh, beach markets trading posts that could be just uh, defended by some sort of garrisons um, slash settlements were connected with the more influential ones this may be uh, the case of uh, Guldme slash Lundeborg in Denmark, right, excavated on the Baltic Isle of Funen, so an important crossroad, as you understand, uh, where a lot of rich, and especially gold, something that you know, the Germans also in their mythology were particularly um, concerned with, um, which also is to be found there mostly between the, th uh, from, from, third to sixth centuries finds thus actually also in this case highlighting a similar dynamic to, to the one happened during the Viking era right these peoples from from the other side of civilization managing to exploit the crisis to loot right to treasure um, this is not just the consequence of raids etc it was also a matter of but it was still connected indirectly with it because a powerful lord could, could just even uh, no, uh, bury uh, this uh, precious um, items for for just for as we'll see now ritual purposes but also as it happened as you know during the migration year with the intention of say maybe hiding it right and uh, maybe having to leave in a certain moment and hoping to come back to find instead remaining there. This is also very frequent in Britain, as you know. Um, but it's the 
um, the the importance of the causal connection here that makes you think that it was the product of a of a naval raid of some sort. Um, this may be also the case of the Dalke Island fort on the southern end of the Bay of Dublin, where imported material from the Mediterranean, from Aquitaine, dating to the 5th and 6th century, has been found. Uh, these places are not just random, because you know that during the Viking era, Dublin would be settled by the Vikings, um, and that there were essentially ring forts on the base of which the same modern city would develop. And um, um, when you consider that how few we know about these times and places, you couldn't even rule out that were, say, I don't know, um, Danish pirates who managed to take control those mm, centers and or acting in cooperation with the local guiles and managed to, you know, to even just to also raid right from there accumulating wealth. You can never distinguish the two aspects because these were all pretty warlike peoples with the Comitatus, the Fiannes, uh, etc. So, um, for them it was just the only possible activity and trade would just follow uh, uh, as a non-violent interaction but they, they would always be up to jump in on a car and uh, you know raiding some stuff um, across uh, the sea so uh, th this aspect of bite not well documented we know we know it's there um, and we should consider it as more habitual than we previously thought, especially um, before the, the second half of the 6th century. There is a center um, where archaeologists have found um, items related to uh, interland cemeteries, such as the Benouville, one on the Orne estuary near Cannes, showing that, of course, there were some, again, trading posts advanced towards the coast that were just used to, uh, in fact, trade as, m as markets. Those were coming from the sea, but uh, these weren't the actual um, centers where most people of the community that owned the posts would leave because it was presumably a dangerous place to stay, and uh, many communities preferred the interland, right? Uh, this is evident throughout uh, the migration here. As you can find in also places that were distant from the sea. People started um, to uh, concentrate on hilltops. Uh, so maybe the, the settlement in the valley remained in use, but eventually sort of citadel forming, even for later in medieval encastellation to develop on um, and some uh, and obviously connected with the, the, the inst local instability, with the risk that derived from raids and from the fact that, yes, the markets, even just logistically, were normally in the flatland, but you needed um, some kind of uh, place where to, to run away or in case of attack, and, and where to enclose your goods, the, the people, the cattle, and so on. This is pretty evident, again, in, for example, in the British Isles as well. Um, in in Saar, on the bank of the Wonsome Channel in Kent, there's a large cemetery from the 6th century where you can find um, the, for example, scales naturally involved with trade um, in such a, of course, a trafficked area, the most uh, commercially active in Britain at the time, where scales were found. There are terps, such as the ones of Vinaldum, um, that are typical of Frisia, um, essentially artificial mounds on the maritime plain that were already elevated for essentially the, the, the tides, the, as you know, the, um, the depressions of, 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 of the area. But also with, for, uh, with um, you know, military purpose, right? Just like the, the Munster, 
in in uh, in Anglo-Saxon Britain, right? They're essentially fortified farms of some sort where this very rich material, in this case, Frisia from uh, Benildum from the sixth and seventh centuries, was imported and or transformed, by the way, because of course, um, if you let's say transform these settlements in also, especially when, as you understand here from the chronology the migration era was over and relations were a bit more peaceful you could just starting to, to establish some um, uh, working shops uh, to just easily from a logistical point of view having the 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 material uh, that was imported already there could transform and re-export from the same place so some kind of even clinic business that was all one with the necessity of protecting this, of guarding it, of you know, keeping the enemies away from such a resource, and so on. So it was a way, of course, of political aggregation as well. Um, this is pretty evident uh, also in southeastern England. Um, one aspect, however, of this coastal trade is that it didn't it, it seemingly was not much connected with a monetary uh, independence of some sort um, we don't find uh, in any of these places in, in the 6th century coin mints um, if they n did as they did need currency they would still use essentially the late Roman and essentially Byzantine coins at the time. The bigger pieces were, of course, the solidity. Um, and there were also some fractions, mostly thirds of, of, of solidus called the trientes or tremises, mm -hmm. which at the time, talking about the 6th century, were mm, essentially reproduced, so, so copied from the Frankish mint masters in gold, right? And for the obvious purpose of still entering the Mediterranean markets. And consequently, this coins would circulate also among the, the, the highest spheres and the most important trades in, uh, in the North Sea. Um, there was, however, just a part of the economy was integrated with currency, right? Uh, aside from metal weights that we have um, uh, entailed, in a sense, before when talking about scales find, uh, like the ones in uh, of some Kentish centuries, um, you don't really see much, um, say, the availability of, of precious metal in the first place and or um, let's say a type of economy would fundamentally revolve around that. It was a lot of barter, of course, um, a reciprocal gift exchange between the elites, right? Um, also connected not with, uh, say, it was all one with trade by a degree, uh, just an economical one, but they were often kind of diplomatic, matrimonial, or social uh, gifts, um, that were sometimes also part of rituals, so that um, that even just the 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 measure of a mon of a monetary economy was not completely part of the picture. They knew the coins were uh, they had a certain value. They, of course, were aware of what it could mean, also as far as the relations with this the continent were, was concerned. But um, their economy worked also in a m much more autonomous way from, from this system, right? Um, the, for example, um, few continental coins that arrived in the British Isles during the 5th and 6th centuries were used mostly as ornaments, seemingly, not as currency. Um, there is, even in Sutton Ho, so we are, as you know, at the beginning of the 7th century, 625, 630, 
the burial of this East Anglian prince, perhaps King Redwald um, of East Anglia. Um, some objects found uh, in, in his ship. The material found in the grave varies dramatically in origin, as much as in quality. We find, for example, Eastern stuff, um, Scandinavian, um, one uh, Rhenish um, object, such as, for example, a hoard of 37 trientes from 37 different Frankish mints. What does the latter especially mean? Well, obviously, it was some sort of ritual diplomatic meaning to it, right? The idea that all the mints of the Frankish domains had um, uh, had contributed to, for example, a dowry given to the deceased by a Frankish wife. It's just an hypothesis, but it could be one thing to, to show properly the support, the endorsement, which uh, wouldn't be so strange, again, considering where the Anglo-Saxons were migrating from, that in some cases from lands that were, in fact, under the Merovingians already at the time. Um, the uh, ship burial number one also contains three coin blanks and two little ingots, right? And uh, you realize there that, of course, it's um, precious metal of different um, form and type, which had a meaning that went beyond the simple wealth accumulation. It's been hypothesized that, given that the ship, um, you know, this this is a burial in a ship, right? So the idea is that these this peoples were so proud of their accomplishments. Um, in, uh, in through essentially a novel invasion that for them it was like uh, again it's like a biting burial if you think about it um, to of course um, see themselves also in afterlife on a ship and it's been suggested that this wealth um, was buried in this case to pay the forty oarsmen and ferrymen of the soul of the dead to the other world. Um, this would be quite a fascinating idea, because of course, aside from weapons, of course, luxury was important. You realize it's it's about like a, a chamber, like a. Of course, there is a commixture between a Uranian uh, transfigurational dimension and or the actonic one, where. Um, you may not know whether this material is literally serving any purpose. If not, you know that probably, of course, was perceived to 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 be owned in a, in a magical and sacred sense through the fact that this man had been able just to accumulate it, right? To to uh, just to uh, for, for for the client to, to to afford such expense, even in the burial. So. They evidently thought that uh, these objects were went beyond just their the the practical more practical function that had been created for, especially as far as the the coins there from different mints that per se just doesn't make much of another sense, but just obviously a um, a symbolic one. Uh, but also concretely provided by a political background that had cared for such display to 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 in fact influence those that same milieu and so on for whichever reason of course these connections mostly with with the continent as you understand are very strong um this is essentially the end of um more heroic phase right one of the conquests the one of of the migration, the one of most turbulence, as we've seen, and um, in at the beginning of the seventh century, things change, right? The the situation becomes more pacific. It would continue essentially until the end of the eighth, with the start of the Viking raids. That, as you understand, are not so distant from 
from the migration era just in uh, well, relatively in time but also in, in modality right so of course there was of course an important degree of connection also between Britain and Scandinavia before uh, the Viking era and as the, just the Anglo-Saxon migration proves per se um, just certain assets certain uh, orders like pol politically socially culturally were different right uh, it's likely changing and there were different lifestyles involved of course the Anglo-Saxons essentially gentrified in a way and uh, civilized and built something that you know the Scandinavians would take much longer to to achieve um, because of course there were two different worlds inhabited also by different people uh, with different influences um, and uh, proximity or fact or distance from different types of, of, of populations of cultures um, so this this is obvious and with time we will see things hopefully more in detail and also not just from a uh, maritime economy point of view um, for today I stop here just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye